Our next speaker is uh, Rachel Friesen. Rachel is a second year master's student at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in Dr. Dina Grossenbacher's lab. She graduated from UC Davis in 2017 with a degree in environmental science and management. And since then, she has worked with the National Park Service in Yosemite and Kings Canyon on a variety of ecological restoration and vegetation monitoring projects. And this morning, she'll be talking about subalpine plant community turnover in Yosemite National Park following 30 years of climate warming. Welcome, Rachel. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be with you all today. So I'm Rachel, and I'm going to be talking about my research in Yosemite's Alpine. So here's just a little sampler of Yosemite's beautiful alpine plant diversity. Alpine plants, like we got to learn about in the previous talk with Jim and Katie's research, they're, they're really small plants. They tend to grow really close to the ground, and they're these long-lived perennials. Alpine plants count their lifespan in often decades or even centuries. And they, if you've spent much time up in the mountains, you know from a distance, it just looks like a pile of rocks. And so these plants have really low cover. They don't cover much area. You have to look in the cracks in the talus to really find them. And despite having low cover, there's incredible amount of biodiversity. In my study plots, we have found over 300 species. And there's an interesting range from both generalist species to specialists. So an example of a specialist species is like Holcia algida here, or alpine gold. These um, asters just grow on the highest peaks. And then there's generalist species like Elemis elamoides or squirrel tail. It grows all over California. And as we all know, climate change is happening, and alpine regions around the world are warming at a faster rate than their lowland counterparts. Here we have average air temperature from near Tioga Pass, um, ranging from 1980 to 2020. And we've seen about a half a degree warming per decade. This is more than twice the global average. And now that's one thing to see evidence of climate change graphically, but it's another thing to see it in person. So here's a photo, or two photos, on the left this is from near Donahue Pass in Yosemite. This is a, on the left is a photo from 1991, and on the right is a photo from 2022, from the same spot. Take a minute and think to yourself, do you notice one or two things that are different between the photos? So standing there in person when we were trying to reestablish this plot is really obvious that the glaciers and the permanent snow fields have really drastically shrunk over this, these 30 years. And then in the foreground, you notice on the far left, there's some white bark pine. In the 90s photo, they're kind of in the shrubby Krumholtz form. And then in 2022, they're growing more in a tree-like form. And then in the foreground, there's all these herbaceous species. And it's kind of unclear what's, what's happening with those, those plants. Are they changing in cover or richness? So as I go through my talk, just keep this visual in mind. Like, this is what I'm talking about. And so scientists have made these general predictions about what's going to happen to alpine plants as the climate warms. We're expecting subalpine plant species to shift upslope. And so the subalpine plant community represented in orange here will be moving into that light gray alpine zone. And then we're also expecting a decline in alpine specialist species. If you're growing on the top of a mountain already, you can't move any higher. And scientists have made these really drastic predictions that some models have made, um, have predicted that up to 90% of alpine habitat will be gone in California by the end of this century. But the question stands, like, will plants really be able to perfectly track their climatic niche? It's probably not the case. And instead, we're expecting there to be lags in dispersal, establishment, and extinction. So an example of an establishment lag 
So say you're a little seed and you successfully move upslope into a, suitable habit, a new suitable habitat, but you get there and you can't get established because you might be missing a mutualist species like a pollinator or a nurse plant. And an example of an extinction lag is if you've spent some time in the mountains, you know that there's a high level of heterogeneity in the landscape. And so maybe you don't even, you don't need to move 100 meters upslope if you can just tuck yourself behind a rock in, in a cool spot. And so my big question is, we've, we've seen that there's already been warming over the last 30 years. Have there been detectable shifts in the alpine plant community already? And so my specific research predictions, I'm expecting there to be an increase in total species richness as subalpine species have moved upslope. And that I think that there's ex considerable extinction lags because like I mentioned, these are really long li lived species. And so it just might take a while for a lot of um, alpine plants to die off. I'm also predicting there to be an increase in vegetation cover. The alpine environment is just becoming more hospitable so plants can grow more and cover more area. And in terms of community composition, I'm expecting there to be just general shifts towards more warm affinity taxa as the climate warms and a decline in alpine specialist species. So lucky for us, how did we test these predictions? Um, in the early 1990s, USGS researchers in the park established these long-term vegetation monitoring plots. They, um, there's 55 plots total that range from, of the, there's lots of plots all throughout the park, but we selected the 55 plots that um, range from 2,800 meters all the way up to um, the crest of the Sierra. And it's fun to notice, we have the original photos of the plots. Um, it's fun to notice the 90s fashion kind of come full circle. The, the fanny pack is back in, or so my undergrad field crew tells me. <laughs> so along with my crew of undergrads, we went out and refound these plots. Um, we had the original coordinates, and, or rough coordinates and original photos. And then most of our plots were marked with a small stainless steel stake. And the plots themselves are 0.1 hectare circles. And we had remarkable success in reestablishing these plots. There are only two plots that we couldn't find of these, of all the plots that we looked for. So when we get to the plot, there's six quadrats within each plot, um, shown in the diagram on the top there. And these quadrats are one meter square quadrats. And in each of these squares, we record a species list, and then we estimate percent cover of each species. And in each plot, there's also two transects, and we use the line intercept method to record total vegetation cover along those transects. So for some pre preliminary results, the data that I'm about to show you, these are from our resurveys that we did in 2022 and 2023. And of the total 55 plots, we selected 10 plots to resurvey twice. So these 10 plots, we resurveyed in both 2022 and 2023. We found that herbaceous species richness increased by 11% on average. On the left, those are the, the historic surveys in the 90s, and then on the right are the, our contemporary surveys. And that effect size is really modest. So each, um, since these are paired data, if you subtract each of those paired points, um, and just to clarify, each point there represents one quadrat and the number of species or the species of richness within that one quadrat. So if you subtract those two paired points, this is what you, what you get, the difference in richness between the contemporary and the historic. And like I said, that effect size is really modest. And since we kind of have these two time point comparisons, the question is, is that an overall trend over the 30 years, or are we just picking up on inner annual variation? And it looks like, indeed, this is really driven by the, 
the big water year that we got in 2023. So remember, we have those 10 plots that we resurveyed in consecutive years. Um, we found, so these are showing the quadrat data from those 10, 10 plots. And we found that there is no significant difference between the 2022 survey and the historic survey. So it seems like there really isn't this 30 year trend in increasing richness. And now I'm going to move on to my second prediction about changes in total cover. We found here that cover increased by 30% on average. And so same thing here on the left is the historic data, on the right is the contemporary. Each dot represents total cover from those transects in one plot. And since those are paired data, if you subtract the, the data from the contemporary minus the historic, this is what we got. And we found, a similar, we found similar results when we looked at trees, shrubs, and herbaceous species separately. So I'm showing here just overall total cover or changes in total vegetation cover, but the same trends happened when you, we looked at each different types of um, growth forms individually. And then the same question, is this just interannual variation or is there, is this, are we getting signals that this is a long-term trend? And so we used those 10 plots that we resurveyed in consecutive years and we found that there were significant differences in cover between all comparisons. So that, that's signaling that it looks like this is perhaps a long-term 30-year trend that we're seeing. And now onto the third prediction about different community composition shifts. So I'm still in grad school and analysis is still in progress with this, um, but just to reiterate, um, these are our expected results. Um, so stay tuned for what we find there. To revisit pred our predictions, we didn't find evidence that there's this long-term 30-year trend in, in changes in species richness. And this is interesting because in other systems, like in the Alps and the Himalayas, they're picking up on um, changes in species richness. And so I'm curious, why, like, why aren't we um, finding this in Yosemite? Even a similar resurvey project in the park to the south in Sequoia Kings picked up on increasing spe species richness so yeah, I'm just curious what's, what's different here in Yosemite. With um, our vegetation cover, we did find an increase in vegetation cover. And this is consistent with what's been called the greening of the alpine. Um, and it's just becoming more, this has been noticed all around the world. And even um, a recent study used satellite imagery and they did a range-wide analysis in the Sierra and other mountain ranges in the West, and they found, yeah, the sig signal of increasing cover. And it's to be determined what the actual community composition shifts are, will be. And I just wanna highlight here, like this is the value of a resurvey project like this one. There's only so much that remote sensing and satellite imagery analysis can tell you. And as botanists, what we really care about is what are, what is ha what are happening to individual species? Um, and that's what's really going to inform potential management actions as the climate continues to change. And so the future of Yosemite's alpine plant diversity, as, with regard to my project, I'm just excited to share with you all maybe next time what we find out as we complete our analysis. And I just wanna acknowledge the seven associated tribes in Yosemite. Um, I think it's really important as botanists that we both learn the history of the places where we do work and do our research, and we also find ways to support ongoing efforts for tribal sovereignty. And this has really been a team effort. I wanna thank especially my advisor, Dina Grossenbacher, and I've had a wonderful team of Cal Poly undergrads that have helped me in the field as well as um, quite a few funders that have made this project possible. And with that, thank you all. And it looks like we have some time for questions, so. Hi, 
Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, did your veg cover include dead? And I assume it probably didn't. But does is there any value in uh, tracking dead in some ways as to find out maybe species changes going on? Yeah, what the what, how the original protocol was written, we're just um, doing like attached living um, vegetation. So yeah, we have no way to capture um, yeah if there's species specific species that are dying off other than making that comparison over time as with abundance. But that's a great question. Thanks. Um, between the uh, previous survey and your current survey, are you aware that if national parks have implemented any kind of veg vegetation management plan? Uh, or if, are you aware if that is something that might be in the future? Yeah, it's, um, do you mean vegetation management plan in terms of like seed banking or like yes, and, conservation and, actions? Yeah. And, and it's particularly in the, in the environment you were serving. In the Alpine. Yeah, um, nothing much has gone on other than monitoring that I'm aware of at this stage. So just trying to collect information to see, yeah, what are overall population trends. But yeah, nothing quite yet. Vascu non vascular plants? No, we didn't. Yeah, we, I mean, we recorded um, just cover of mosses and lichens, but um, not down to any species level, just, yeah, generic categories. <clears throat> I have a question about uh, what you thought of the plot style that you did. I know Jim and Katie talked about taking doing some modifications on the fly. Well, I guess it's not really on the fly, but over the years, and you are resurveying plots that were a style of the 90s. Are you thinking of any, have you found you might like to do modifications yep. going <clears throat> forward? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and in fact, we, we have installed some new monitoring plots. I need a whole nother talk for this, but we used um, Jim and Katie's downslope Gloria method on Mount Dana this summer to establish some new plots. And it kind of speaks to, yeah, using the point intercepts method is generally much better than a doing visual ocular estimate. So there's definitely some, um, yeah, this, we were restricted in that we were only able to use the, the historic survey methods so that we could compare the data. But there's definitely a number, if I were to time travel back to the 90s, I would have suggested some changes for sure. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to question is, um, I've done a lot of high Sierra mountaineering and it's a beautiful zone. And I just wanted to see if you could say something about how you get to your field sites and, uh, you know, it must be really enjoyable if you have a little anecdote about that. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, most of our work isn't even the botanical work, it's just hiking and backpacking, and, and that's another thing is there's, um, when installing new plots, we wanted to do it close to the road so it like reduces the amount of like unit effort time that it takes to get to these, to get to the survey sites. So most of our trips tended to be around five days to up to like a week long, um, pretty deep. These were randomly placed plots, so we're going pretty deep into the backcountry, off trail. It's a lot of route, route finding and getting kind of sometimes just like stuck in boulder fields with heavy week-long backpacks. And um, so it was an adventure and yeah, had some some sturdy um, undergrads that um, stuck through it too. So, but definitely it's both beautiful and exhausting work <laughs> to work in the, um, the Sierra Alpine. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, this is from the online Q&A from great. Paul X. Goffer. Uh, he said, great talk. Uh, if these are long-lived perennial species, what is responsible for the fluctuation in species richness across your plots that you sampled twice? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, a lot of that comes down to, I, I think just phenology and timing. So the 2020, 20, or sorry, 2022 was a fairly dry year. And so even though we surveyed around the same time, I think some species were just less detectable. So think about some tiny like Lewisia species in the Alpine. They're about yay tall and then they shrivel up into like a dry husk. 
So if you miss that window, you might not, you might miss some of those more cryptic species. So I think that's what was really driving the difference. Um, yep, thank you. Hi, Rachel, great talk. A uh, question for you to follow up on that last question. Are there specific alpine specialist taxa that you anticipate seeing a decline in in the reed survey plots? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, that's a great question. I'm not sure yet. Um, I think anecdotally, just comparing photos and rough species lists so far, a lot of the, the showy species, like we, we're still finding um, Holcia algida or sky pilot in plots. And so some of those like very charismatic species, it, was, it felt good to be like, oh, they're, they're still there, but that's just anecdotal. So um, yeah, I'm excited to see, to share with you all what, once we do more of that community analysis, what species might be in decline. So I'm, it looks like I've reached my time, but thank you all so much. <laughs>